Here's an idea. Google is knowledge. So a couple years ago, some friends of mine and I were trying to remember the name of the guy. You know, the guy in the show with the spaceships. Anyway, none of us could remember the name of the guy, so one of us Googled it. It was Nathan Fillion, by the way, which all of us should have known. And then out of nowhere, one of my friends says, yeah, well, you know, we are past the age of memory. Say what? Sure, Google might be what Wikipedia co-founder Larry Sanger calls a mental prosthesis, but past the age of memory? Really? This idea is all over the internet, though. The internet is changing how we think. The internet, our brains, what's the deal? Technology, everything's different. I'm scared. Larry Sanger has also written that you can find information on the internet very easily. Knowledge is another matter entirely. Herein lies the quandary. With all of this information available all the time, are we not somehow getting more knowledgeable? Is Google not itself, knowledge. I say, well, yeah. But before we get too much further, let's talk about what knowledge actually is, other than power. There are about as many theories of knowledge as there are things to know. Personally, I like John Locke's theory. In his essay concerning human understanding, he writes that the mind hath no other immediate object but its own ideas. Knowledge, he writes, is the perception of, the connection of, and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas. In short, you got stuff in your brain zone. And the way that stuff relates to all the other stuff, well, that there's knowledge. Ideas themselves are not knowledge. Knowing the facts is not the same as knowing. You know, like you can be in possession of the facts that Nathan Fillion is 42 years old, was born in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and voiced Frisbee Guy on King of the Hill, but those facts are meaningless if you don't know who Nathan Fillion is and don't have a use for them, which I imagine you do. Facts and ideas become knowledge when they relate to and are put to use with and against other facts and ideas. If an idea is a Lego piece, then knowledge is the 5,922 piece Lego Taj Mahal. What the internet does is makes available to us all of the Lego pieces we would ever need. And that is a dual-edged sword. Also made of Lego, probably. Actually made of all of the Lego. You'll also notice that I started saying Lego and not Legos. In a step towards the perfectly transhumanist brain, we have these little boxes at the end of our arms that can answer any question at any time. Beep boop beep, Nathan Fillion is six foot two. But there are some folks who argue that this is awful for our brains. And they make two major points. One, that there are enough neat and surface level facts and tidbits, many of them about Mr. Fillion, that we will never dig deep enough into any one thing to build knowledge. And two, that there is so much out there that even if we wanted to build knowledge, that it is so overwhelming we don't or can't. Many of these concerns are summed up very nicely by a question asked by Mr. George Dyson. What if the cost of machines that think is people who don't? I am totally unconvinced though that Google built knowledge is any more taxing or distraction laden than any of the old fashioned methods. If someone lived in a very well stocked library and could avail themselves of any information they wanted, would people be all like, uh, excuse me, you're never gonna learn anything in that library. There's too many books, just too many. No, of course they wouldn't. And don't tell me that libraries don't have books full of pictures of cats. I know they do. I've been to libraries. But yes, I understand the point. It is very easy to get distracted on the internet. But does that mean that we are now bad at constructing knowledge? That seems like a bit of a stretch. The way we behave is different, sure, but it's only different because facts themselves and knowledge itself is also different. There used to be a kind of romance surrounding knowing because you had to work really hard to get the answer, maybe from the source that was edited and distributed and locked in a filing cabinet behind a secret door at the library at the end of the you get what I'm saying. Now, wanting to know and knowing happen at roughly the same time. Sort of like how your brain works, actually. And there is no shortage of places offering up things to know and their set of the facts. In his book, Too Big to Know, David Weinberger writes about what he calls networked facts. He writes that we don't see facts marching single file within the confines of an argument contained within a blue book, a scientific article, or a printed tome. We see them picked up, splattered against a wall, contradicted, torn apart, amplified, and mocked. We are witnessing a version of Newton's second law. On the net, every fact has an equal and opposite reaction. This continuous, multi-sided, linked contradiction of every fact, he writes, changes the nature and role of facts for our culture. It also necessarily changes how knowledge is made. If the metaphor for becoming an expert is doing a deep dive, well then now the body of water is much, much larger. Each layer of facts to be connected in order to develop a real sense of knowing has expanded. Where we used to deep dive in wells, now we deep dive in the Pacific Ocean. 
over the Marianas Trench. The Mariana Trench. So many different ideas, lots of them contradictory, exist in heretofore unseen proximity, both to each other and to us. Which as a side note is also, I think, a reason for the uptick in fan fiction ships, but that's another thing entirely. Ideas are linked to and from one another, contextualized in countless ways by their mere existence on the internet. They are a heterogeneous assemblage, a thing that accomplishes more than its parts ever could. The act of remembering then is now just as much physical and technological as it is biological and mental, and that is okay. And it makes sense that knowledge complexifies alongside the things which need to be known. Plus, if we agree with John Locke's definition of knowledge, take a bunch of ideas and synthesize a relationship, well then Google itself is knowledge. Google knows, Amazon knows, Wikipedia knows, Netflix knows, especially when it recommended that I watch Twin Peaks for the third time. Netflix just gets me. Which I guess makes sense. If, like Hank Green says, Google wants and is therefore alive, I suppose it makes sense that it also knows. What do you guys think? Is Google knowledge? Let us know in the comments, and you know what to do. I would like to revise my previous statements. The internet is clearly a series of tubes. The tubes, however, are filled with cats. Let's see what you guys had to say about the internet is cats. First of all, thank you to Joe Hansen and all of the other biologists who let us know that toxoplasmosis is not a virus, but a parasite. I have added an annotation to that episode so that everybody knows how dreadfully incorrect I was. And to everybody who says that cat people are on the internet because dog people go outside, I think I know more people who are tied to their homes by their dogs than by their cats. I don't buy it. I'm pretty sure no one has ever been like, I, I gotta, I can't, I gotta go home. The cat needs, the cat doesn't need you. To Supernova and everybody who wants to go to the website with the wiggly thing where it goes crazy, it's staggeringbeauty.com. Craft double two double nine. Does the sun ever run out of shine? Does the ocean ever run out of wet? Does Matt Smith ever run out of chin? I don't think so. Now, nah, man, the way that it works is that you use your kitchen. Your kitchen has a microwave in it. You use your microwave to cook popcorn. People eat popcorn, and therefore it's a part of them so that through the internet is popcorn. It's okay, that one's really complicated. Pedro Paramo de Valle theorizes a connection between cats and eternal September, which is really interesting, so that when uh, the internet first became home to new users, they would post pictures of their pets, and then the rest is history. Really possible. To Kopi Pop and everyone else who says that the internet is not cats but is rather porn, Dented Bells and Adam Weaver 43 have really great responses to all of those comments. We'll pause here for a second so you can read them. I totally agree. Jason Wilkins suggests that cats might be part of a kind of cat spiracy, and that seems to be furthered even more by Icona Kona's point that the internet is brought to us on Cat 5 and 6 cables, threatening music plays. SilverJ47, did it work? Let us know in the comments. 2621 Infamous in the words of Lana Kane. Yup. Citizens, do not think about the dog park. Also, we're gonna make this episode. Mr. Dags Quadruple Zero makes a really fair point that this argument would be a lot more compelling if we could show that cats were popular on the entirety of the world wide web and not just the western web. I don't know. My impulse is to say yes, but maybe some of our international viewers can let us know if cats are as popular around the world as they are in the western web. Good point. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these hooded figures. Don't think about the dog park. This week's Tweet of the Week comes from Bookmore, who sends us a link to an article describing how Germany has made Bitcoin an official currency. And finally, a bit of news. We are going to take a play out of The Daily Show's book and take a two-week break. So we'll see you in two weeks. I'll still be on the IRC and on the internet, so say hi, but no full episodes for another two weeks. Have a good summer, or two weeks of August if you're in the Southern Hemisphere.